Well, President Harker, uh, you, you take the opportunity during Alumni Week any year to, to give a state of the university presentation. From the president's perspective, what is the state of UD after the 2010-2011 school year? You no, know, just like the president says in the State of the Union, it's strong. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, uh, we've had an incredible year. If you think about the year that the university's had uh, from hosting the debates um, to a Nobel Prize, a Rhodes Scholarship, our 12th in our history. Uh, it's been in a wonderful, wonderful year. And it culminates with this time of year where we graduate a great group of students who are going out into a tough economy, but very, very well trained and really looking forward to the next phase of their life. And of course, bringing the alumni back uh, this weekend to celebrate what's happening. You've just finished up your Middle States reaccreditation, uh, a generally positive report coming out of that. Uh, of the positive things they had to say about UD, was there one that was particularly satisfying to you? Yeah, I mean, what they talked about in particular was about the people. You know, they talked about a lot of things we're doing, strategy, this and that, and the pace of change they called breathtaking at the university. But then they talked about the quality of the people. And ultimately, that's what makes this place great. Yes, we need facilities. Yes, we need strategy. But it's about the people here. And I was really, really happy that they picked up on that. One of the areas of criticism in the report was diversity. They said, with few exceptions, the university trails its peers in every measure of diversity in every constituency of the institution. How do you and how does the school actively address that? Well, we do need to address it because we cannot let any talent sit on the sidelines. This, this country, this state, this university needs everybody involved you know, with different perspectives. So when it comes to recruiting students, we need to make sure that we have a diverse pool and that we actively pursue uh, those students to make sure they become part of this community. But then when they get here, to make sure that they're integrated into the life of the university so everybody can learn from each other. I mean, what's, what good is it to bring a diverse group together that sit, sit in their own corners. Uh -huh. We need to bring them together where they can share their ideas. Same thing with our faculty and our staff. Is there a concern about changing the perception, maybe the changing the perception leading to that kind of cohesiveness that you're looking for? Oh, sure. I mean, and that we've been working very hard at, at the university for the past several years. Uh -huh. But we now need to just accelerate our progress in this area. Well, anyone who's on campus, including, I'm sure, the alumni who come back here this weekend, will see much of the construction that is going yeah. on, the capital improvements from the new bookstore to the work over the Bob Carpenter Center to, of course, the, the old Chrysler plants. Right. Uh, how do you feel the university is in terms of where it wants to be in infrastructure improvement? Are you where you would like to be? Is the progress being made in that area that you'd like to, be, have, to, like to see? Well, of course, we'd always want to do things, and we ha we're squeezed in space in so many ways. But yeah, I think we are generally pretty satisfied. I mean, in addition to all the new stuff, we have to take care of uh -huh. what exists today. So Allison Hall will start a major renovation this summer. So right on the green in the middle of campus, we need to make sure that it's functional and it will serve the needs of our faculty and our students for years to come. So the new things are fantastic, but we can't forget that we have to take care of what exists today as well. The, the newest, the biggest of the new pieces, obviously, is the, is the old Chrysler plant. Right. Uh, where does that stand right now in terms of the timeline that you foresee for mm -hmm. being eventually being what you w wish it to be, what you envision it being? So we are, the, the old Chrysler plant was approximately 4 million square feet of space under roof. We have taken down about three of the 4 million square feet already. We have a million to go. So we'll be finishing up here in the next half year or so. Uh, we're recycling almost 90 percent of everything coming out of the plant. We're very proud of that. Um, then we are working with the state uh, very closely, with the governor in particular, on trying to attract leading companies and other entities to be on that site that makes sense for us. And what do I mean by that? Entities that want to take advantage of our faculty research capability, and or uh, student internship opportunities, jobs for our students. That's what we're looking at on that site. So everything will be coming down except the old administration building, which we will be using to house a part of our health science campus. And this will be our College of Health Sciences, but also over time Thomas Jefferson is part of the Health Science Alliance uh -huh. moving down. It, will that process of, of drawing people to that campus accelerate 
once this groundwork is laid, once sure. things are taken out, then, then you can, I guess, maybe start showing people what it's actually going to look yeah, like. Yeah, I mean, once we get a f our few first tenants in there, then we can also start laying out the grid, the infrastructure, the roads, right. the sewers, the electrical work that's necessary for developers then to come in and start to build out the rest of the site. I wanted to ask you how welcome the, the additional $10 million the governor is proposing to send UD's way as part of his uh, Building Delaware's uh, Future Now yeah. program. That, that had to be something you were, you were excited to hear about when he announced oh, it a couple of years ago. And we hope we, this will go, you know, come to pass. Uh, I mentioned Allison Hall. Allison Hall uh, houses our College of Health Science, uh, our College of Education and Human Development. It houses several other entities. It's desperately in need of rehabilitation. And so the money will be used for that, for a couple of other facilities on campus. But we absolutely uh, welcome the opportunity to use this money to accelerate not just what we, we're doing here on campus, but to put people to work. Uh, last Board of Trustees meeting, uh, the idea of examining a, a law school at right. the University of Delaware was, was shelved. Uh, was that a difficult decision, particularly considering there, was, there seemed to be a lot of buzz about it yeah. when it was announced back in December? Was that a tough decision to make to say it, it's just not the right time? Um, I don't think it was a tough decision when you really looked at it, when we, and we had to take the time to look at it carefully. You know, we for decades have been talking about this. I mean, this is not a new concept. Mm -hmm. But we needed to clearly lay out what it would take to build a world-class law school. And when you looked at it, and the cost of doing that in a bad economy, when other things like our science and technology building and other activities uh, going on on campus need to be done, we just can't do it right now. What was clear out of that study is that there's clearly a need for it, and there's a desire to do it. It's just not now, because the money's not there. And I guess that's, that maybe that is the hardest part of the decision, is knowing that there is that, that want and need for it. It's just, as you said, the timing's just not right. Right. One of the other decisions I wanted to ask you about has, has drawn a fair amount of attention, the decision to drop the, the men's track and field and cross-country right. teams to, to club status. I know that's currently a mediation, kind of limits right. what you can say about it. But what I was curious about was, were you surprised by the intensity that was brought by those who opposed that decision? And has that at all maybe changed the perspective of, of how you would, in future cases, uh, go through this process and, and go through the notification process and I guess basically the process of, yeah. of, of dealing with a situation like this. Well, as you said, I really can't comment because we're in mediation, but more generally, and I won't talk about track and field, but mm -hmm. uh, more generally. No, I'm not surprised because people are passionate about athletics, but again, not just about athletics, but the band, our theater mm -hmm. programs. I mean, an education at a university is not just about what happens in the classroom, but what happens outside the classroom as well. So I wasn't, uh, I, I really wasn't surprised by it. But what it means for us is that we need to make sure that we continue to provide those opportunities for our students, whether it's club sports, uh, or in the case of the theater program, great theater for students who are interested in that. It's really creating those out of class experiences and supporting those. Can everything be a varsity sport? No. Can everything be a professional theater program? No. Uh, so you need to put it in context of what the university can afford to do, and in, case, in some cases where there are legal uh, limits to what we can do. But I'm not surprised by the, the passion, because this means a lot to people, and we understand that. But sometimes you have to make hard decisions that aren't easy to do, easy to make. Are you hopeful that some of the, the efforts in terms of facilities with athletics uh, are going to help in terms of opening it up for uh, the non-varsity athletes oh, at, at the school. Yeah, that's absolutely intent. For example, the expansion of the Bob Carpenter Center right now, the Bob, uh, those two gyms will be used by our varsity basketball and volleyball programs, but also by our club and intramural programs as well. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, sustainability initiatives on the campus. That's been a major focus over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you feel this, the school has made uh, progress in that area uh, of, of creating a more sustainable campus? Mm -hmm. Well, I think we've made a lot of progress. We still have a lot to do. Uh, we have the largest rooftop installation of solar panels in Delaware, third largest of any East Coast uh, college or university, the wind turbine in Lewis. And here's where we need to you know, eat our own cooking or walk the talk, you know, whatever uh, phrase you want to use. We are a leader in alternative energy research absolute world leader in many, many areas of alternative energy research. We need to practice what we preach. And that's what I'm very proud of. You're seeing that happen. 
Where we need to make more progress is on the individuals making choices. So we can do all this as a university and we make progress. But we also need the students to turn out the lights <laughs> when they leave their dorm room. I mean, so there are the big things that we need to do and are doing as a university with our recycling programs and everything else. But we need the students and our faculty and staff and the community at large to actually practice these sustainability activities. You know, it's, it's hard enough, and I understand this as a parent, to get your children to turn off the lights when they leave <laughs> a, a room at home. We have the same problem here. Uh, you mentioned the wind turbine down in Lewis. Uh, is, is there any disappointment that, that some of the other wind initiatives in Delaware, the Blue Water Wind Program, seem to be uh, maybe hitting some barriers? Does, does that impact the university and what, and what you are hoping, maybe in terms of partnerships, you could, you could do with that wind project uh, down in Lewis? Not at this point. I mean, our fundamental research activity continues because the turbine, again, in Lewis is not just producing power for mm -hmm. the campus, but it's also a research vehicle. Right. The need for offshore wind is so compelling and the opportunity along this coast from Massachusetts to North Carolina with Delaware as the epicenter is so compelling that somebody sometime is going to get this done. And so we need to continue our work in terms of research both on the technical aspects of it but also on understanding public perception um, so that when this is ready and the capital markets are there to fund it, we'll be ready. Is there a moment from this past academic year that's a, a highlight, a personal highlight for, for you as president? Oh, I think there are, there are a lot of them, but without a doubt, the morning you wake up and you realize a sweet, gentle man, Richard Heck, won the Nobel Prize. I mean, that's one of those moments that universities don't get very often. And, the, and for somebody who, there are Nobel Prizes and then there are Nobel Prizes. I mean, this is a prize that was given to him for a lifetime of work that truly transformed chemistry and helped the modern pharmaceutical industry, <coughs> the materials industry, and so on, actually exist because of the Heck reaction, because of what he did. By the same token, <coughs> uh, are you at a point now with the, the academic year over that you're, you're already looking forward to, to welcoming the next class, the class of 2015? Oh, absolutely. We, we turn around right after alumni weekend in a few weeks here and start our orientation program, Delaware World, with the new freshmen coming with their families. So. We don't take much of a break. <laughs> President Harker, we appreciate the time and uh, appreciate you giving us an insight into the state of the university. Thank you.